Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm Jason Rantanen, the Hammer Boy Professor of Law and Director of the University of Iowa College of Law's Innovation Business and Law Center. Uh, thank you all for joining us in person and online. So today I'm delighted to welcome Professor Brian Fry. Um, now, as encouraged by Brian himself and Ascent on Plagiarism, I've decided to take my introduction from other sources, but in a counter-cultural, counter-cultural kind of way, I'm going to actually identify the sources I borrowed from. So, now, according to his Wikipedia entry, Professor Brian Lawrence Fry is an American independent filmmaker, artist, and law professor. His 2013 film, Our Nixon, was released at the International Film Festival Rotterdam and distributed on both television and theatrically. His work, Una's Veil, is included in the permanent collection of the Whitney Museum of Art. And Wikipedia says that he is currently the Spears Gilbert Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. And you can read more fascinating details about his filmmaking career and opinions on the bar exam and the legal profession on Wikipedia. Now, on the other hand, LinkedIn says that Brian Fry is an experienced shipping supervisor with a demonstrated history of working in the paper and forest products industry. Skilled in negotiation, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word, strategic planning, and business process improvement. Now, while I suspect this isn't the same Brian Fry because the picture has a beard and no glasses, um, these attributes seem to describe him as well. Now, Twitter tells me that Brian L. Fry is a persona with more followers than um, pretty much every college quarterback. Um, he's the Dogecoin professor of law and grifting at the University of Kentucky College of Law, a securities artist whatever that is, um, and that the SEC Gov describes his scholarship as fanciful. He's also the producer and co-host of the Ipsy Dixit podcast on legal scholarship, which you all go and subscribe to. Now, the Federalist Society's webpage informs me that Brian L. Fry teaches classes in civil procedure, intellectual property, copyright, and nonprofits organizations, as well as a seminar on law and popular culture. Previously, he was a litigation associate at Sullivan and Cromwell LLP. He clerked for Judge Andrew J. Kleinfeld of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Justice Richard B. Sanders of the Washington Supreme Court. Before that, he received a JD from NYU Law School, an MFA from San Francisco Art Institute, and a PA from UC Berkeley. Now, curiously, none of the top 10 hits that showed up when I typed Brian Fry into Google were to his bio at the University of Kentucky. <laughs> but when you do find it, it doesn't really tell you much. So, none of this, however, really captures the vast range of Professor Fry's work, which is sometimes serious scholarship, sometimes conceptual art, and sometimes both. It always challenges existing dogma, whether in law, art, or society. I've heard Professor Fry speak on numerous occasions, and inevitably I'm left with a new perspective on a topic that I thought I already knew everything about. So I'm not going to attempt to introduce his talk. I'll let him do that himself. Amazing. Well, thank you, Jason, for the generous introduction. I, I hope the talk uh, lives up to the high expectations that you've established. And uh, great to see uh, all of you here in the room. This is my first time at the University of Iowa in 25 years. The last time I was here was after art school, but before law school. And I was invited to be, uh, by a bunch of University of Iowa undergrads, or grad students and gra undergrads, to be a, uh, a judge for an experimental film festival that they were hosting here, which was a lot of fun. And it's, it's great to be back uh, in a different capacity, but hopefully not as different as, as all that. Because in today's class, we're going to be talking about a wide range of different things. Uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about NFTs, which I assume many, if not most of you, have at least some inkling of and have perhaps heard about, for better or, or for worse. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about artwork, and we're going to be talking about securities law, and we're going to be talking about securities regulation. And you may be wondering right now, why would we be talking about those things? Bear with me. Bear with me. You will understand by the time the next 40 minutes are up, I hope. Um, so uh, just by way of introducing the talk, uh, I first became interested in the NFT market around the same time as I think a lot of other people did. As it started building and, and kind of taking off in the end of 2020 and then uh, in the beginning of 2020 one when there was the sale of the Beeple work every days at Sotheby's for over a million dollars making it at that time the most expensive artwork uh, ever sold at auction uh, as someone interested in both copyright 
And art law, I figured I, I better start paying attention to the NFT marketplace and trying to figure out what was going on. Because at first I was very confused and thought the entire thing was kind of a weird kind of Dadaist joke on, on the art market. Um, and I think uh, one of your professors, Christopher Odenet, is pretty much of that same mind as, as I believe uh, Jasmine is as well. Um, I understand where they're coming from, but I want to offer a different perspective, uh, or at least a different way of looking at the NFT marketplace through a different lens that maybe will help us understand why it's happening, what's going on, and what it can tell us about the art market, uh, about markets in general, and how we should think about regulating in this space. So I'm going to start the talk by asking a really big question. What is an artwork? What is art? What is an artwork? Uh, it seems like in some ways it might be an easy question to answer, right? We're familiar with artwork. On the left, you see uh, probably the most famous, uh, at the very least, the most quote unquote valuable artwork in the world, uh, the paint, or at least a representation thereof, to, uh, pop, uh, uh, with uh, homage to Magritte, uh, a representation of the Mona Lisa uh, hanging in the Louvre, uh, you know, the famous painting traveled to the United States with Kennedy and it's considered the most valuable painting in the world, although of course the fact that it's never going to be for sale makes putting a price on it a little bit, uh, a little bit arbitrary. In any case, an object, right? A painting. In the middle, you see uh, a work by Marcel Duchamp based on the Mona Lisa, right? Uh, uh, kind of a, a detourment, as it were, of the Mona Lisa, a work he created, El Acho au Cou. For those of you who speak French, you might uh, note the uh, somewhat ribald connotations of the, uh, of the, uh, the, 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 the phrase that he puts at the bottom of of the work, uh, drawing a, a, a mustache on the Mona Lisa, kind of poking fun at the art world, but still an object, right? A work on, on paper. And then on the far right, you see uh, one of Andy Warhol's uh, many uh, variations on the, uh, on the Mona Lisa in his, uh, in his kind of uh, characteristic style of, uh, of multiple silk screening in a kind of quasi-factory format. Uh, again, that kind of pop art, somewhat questioning the concept of art as a craft and the artist as, uh, as uh, having the artist's hand kind of present in the artwork, but nevertheless, still an object, right? Still a physical, a physical thing. Um, so the easy assumption, right, is that an artwork, the thing that's bought and sold in the art market is an object. Right? Or at least something akin to an object. Right? Of course, we've got things like performance art and conceptual art where the object is dematerialized. But there's some sense in which uh, what's being bought and sold is still ownership of some particular thing. That's totally wrong. Everything I just said is wrong. None of that is true. Right? What is an artwork? An artwork is an entry, or at least what is an artwork from the perspective of the art market? An artwork is an entry on a catalog raisonné. That's it. Right? What is a catalog raisonné? It's the list of all of the works that the art market considers properly attributed to a particular artist. If a work appears on the artist catalog raisonné, it is an authentic artwork and is therefore valuable in the art market. If an artwork does not appear in the catalog raisonné, it is inauthentic and its value on the art market is zero. Right? So when you buy an artwork and you receive a physical object, what you're really buying is an entry on the catalog raisonné. And that entry on the catalog raisonné that you've purchased, for whatever amount you've purchased it for, it could be millions and millions of dollars in some cases, comes along with a physical object. It comes along with a dirty piece of cloth or a lumpy rock that is a physical token that represents ownership of the entry on the catalog raisonné, which is all that really matters. Right? You want to own the entry on the catalog raisonné because that's what makes the physical token valuable. Without the catalog entry, the value of the physical token is zero. And it's really easy to demonstrate, right? Because if a painting is considered a forgery or not properly attributable to an artist, 
whatever value it may have had before the forgery was discovered or prior to the disavowal of the work by the artist instantly disappears because that work has no value whatsoever on the art market. You cannot sell it on the art market. Now, might it potentially have value as a decorative object? Yes. But that's not an artwork, right? at least as I'm defining it. It's only an artwork if it's tradable on the art market, on the market for artworks, not for the market uh, for, for decorative objects. OK, now, there are, of course, lots of kinds of artwork in which the physical object is literally a token. Right, literally a physical token. You see on the left another work by uh, Marcel Duchamp. Uh, this is his uh, Monte Carlo bonds, as, as they're generally known. Essentially, uh, Marcel Duchamp had these printed up and sold them to people as a putative investment in a secret strategy that he had developed uh, in order to win at roulette at Monte Carlo. It turned out that the uh, strategy was, was not successful. And he did not, in fact, win at roulette at Monte Carlo to any appreciable degree. But it didn't matter, right? Because what the purchasers of the Monte Carlo bonds wanted was the physical object that represented ownership of a Marcel Duchamp work, right? And the physical object was worth far more than, or rather, the artwork was worth far more than, than the face value of the bond in question. I thought it would also be represented by uh, artists like uh, J.S.C. Boggs, right? It was an artist who drew money and then sold the money to people for the face value of the money. And people wanted, and collectors wanted to purchase the artwork because the face value of what he drew was irrelevant. What they wanted to purchase was the token that represented ownership of the work by J.S.C. On the top right, you see another, uh, uh, another similar kind of token. An interesting one in this case, it's uh, for uh, a work by Eve Klein called uh, the Zone de Sensibilité Picturale Immaterial, Zone of Immaterial Pictorial sen Sensibility. Um, and the interesting thing about Eve Klein was he stipulated that while you could receive the certificate for purchasing the artwork, the artwork was not fully realized until you destroyed the certificate in question, uh, trying to get at this idea of like, what do you really own? Do you want the artistic experience or do you want the capacity to resell the investment in, in the product, right? And then on the bottom right, you see a certificate for a work of conceptual art that I myself created called SEC No Action Letter Request. And I'll get back to the substance of that work in, in a moment, uh, but I just always enjoy putting myself in this company uh, some of my so apologies for that. Um, OK, here you see another uh, example of a, uh, a certificate for a Solowit uh, wall drawing, right? Uh, Solowit, uh, considered like one of, if not the founder of uh, conceptual art, described conceptual art as art where the idea of the work is where the art takes place, and the realization of the work described is uh, only incidental to the artwork in question, uh, and Solowit sold his artwork by selling these certificates which describe how to create a wall drawing. Uh, most of these wall drawings are not actually copyrightable works of authorship. Anyone could create these works and use their own name attached to them or even sell them arguably as, as Solowit wall drawings because that would in fact be true. Uh, they would, however, not be legitimate Solowit wall drawings because uh, Solowit has stipulated that the only way a wall drawing is legitimate is if it is authorized by ownership of the certificate in, in question. So why do I go into uh, all this uh, rigmarole about uh, what is an artwork? Well, the reason is because every artwork, every work that has a value on the art market is not an object. Right? It's just the catalog raisonné entry, which is to say that effectively an artwork is an investment in an artist's celebrity or clout. In effect, when you buy a work of art on the art market, when you own an artwork, what you own is an investment in the future commercial goodwill associated with it. You're buying a percentage of an artist. That's what you're really buying. You're not buying an object at all. You're making an investment. And it stands to reason, right? 
because there's no reason to invest millions and millions of dollars in, uh, in an object unless you think you're going to be able to get a return on, on your investment. So in effect, when you buy an artwork, what you're doing is you're investing in your belief that that artist who's represented by the artwork that you've purchased is going to be more famous and more popular in the future than they are today, and therefore the value of your investment. Is that a sure thing? No, right? Because in fact, most artists don't end up becoming famous, right? So the big secret of the art world is that 99% you know, of works sold on the primary market have literally no value whatsoever on the, secondary mar on the secondary market because it turned out the artist in question didn't end up being popular. And therefore, nobody wants to buy the work. And therefore, what you're left with is a valueless catalog entry and a nice decorative object you can put on the wall. That's that bully for you, right? Nothing wrong with that. Art is pretty to look at, but it's not an investment anymore. A worthless investment. OK, so let's move on. What is an NFT? Well, typically, we think, oh, an NFT, that's like a digital image, right? So here you can see CryptoPunks up there on the left. Board Ape Yacht Club, Lazy Lions, Goblin Town. I like this one a lot. It's a, it's a what is a jokes uh, person of the day, right? They do sort of crypto punk style uh, images of different historical celebrities that you can purchase very inexpensively. So I recommend that collection. But nouns, uh, crypto skulls. I don't know if any of you are NFT fans out there, um, but you know, if you are, you'll be familiar with with a lot of these. A lot of these different images. This is the most common form that NFTs, or at least the most popular right now form that NFTs take. There's what's known as a, a PFP collection, typically uh, uh, a sort of procedurally generated set of, of, of digital images uh, in a collection of you know anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000. It can be any any different number that that you want that are sold to the public on various NFT marketplaces. Um, and either go up or down in, in value. And incidentally, if anyone here is in fact an NFT collector and has a wallet, I, I will give anyone here, in honor of the merge, uh, I will give anyone here who asks me, uh, either in person or via email or whatever, if you send me your wallet address, I will deposit in it a NFT of my own making for free. Just let me know uh, if you want an NFT, if you want to invest in Brian Fry uh, and the, my future popularity, you are uh, invited to do so. Um, OK, there's other kinds of NFTs too, though, right? PFP projects are the most popular and the best known. Uh, but there's also a lot of what's known as kind of more fine art, one of one NFTs. Uh, you can see down here work by Rhea Myers. It's kind of a certificate based work. Uh, she was a very early uh, entrant to the NFT marketplace. The trash art, I think this one was by Rob Ness. Uh, this is an artist called Wombat, who's a friend of a friend. I have Death Thief, uh, he's an on-chain NFT artist, uh, which is in uh, Tyler Hobbs Fidenza, uh, Squiggles, right? So the, there's a bunch of these uh, other NFT projects that are more closely associated with, with what we would understand as the conventional art market than the PFP projects tend to be. They, the PFP projects seem to t tend to come mostly from, from the tech world, but uh, there's increasing crossover between PFP and, uh, and, and, and art art world type, type projects. He's at least the potential promise of, of the NFT market. So we think about the, all these different, what is an NFT? It could be a lot of different things in relation to the image that's being represented. Of course, an NFT could really be anything at all. It doesn't have to be associated with an image. In fact, it doesn't have to be used for this particular purpose. It's a technology that could, in theory, be put in a lot of different uses. And lots of people in the financial sector insurance sector looking to NFTs, potential ways of facilitating some of the processes they, they use in their models. I don't know anything about that from a practical standpoint, but uh, a lot of very smart and capable people looking into it. So I assume that they have an idea that at least there's, there's a possibility it could be used for certain. OK. However, right, the key thing to realize on NFT is an NFT is not an image. Right? It's just a, a, a ledger entry on the blockchain. That's it, right? What is an NFT? It's data on the blockchain that represents something other than uh, a, a value or a quantity of the native currency of that particular blockchain. So it can be anything at all. It's merely conventional that we use NFTs typically to represent digital images, right? That the digital image is associated with 
the NFT. And in fact, it could, it could represent anything at all. There's no, there's no need whatsoever for it to represent a, di a digital image uh, or ownership of a digital image, as I like to call it. Um, it's just a convention that we, that for some reason the market has settled on. It's unclear whether that will necessarily be the way the market in the future, right? The, the, the point is that the NFT itself doesn't even include the image in any meaningful sense. Writing information on the blockchain is very expensive. So typically, with, with some exceptions that don't really matter for our purposes today, typically an NFT simply consists of enough data to show who owns the NFT and enables them to transfer it to someone else, uh, as well as a URL pointing somewhere else typically to a digital image file, often on the, uh, the universal file. OK. Um, but it doesn't include anything else, right? So what do you own? What do you get when you purchase an NFT? Effectively, the only thing you get is the ability to transfer that NFT, to, the, the unique ability to transfer that NFT. Well, that's all you own, right? There's nothing that you own beyond the ability to, to, to transfer that ledger entry to another person, uh, and only because the market believes that the NFT represents a particular di digital image does it have any value, or represents something, <laughs> I guess I should say, that it has any value whatsoever, right? So what's the relationship then between uh, the, uh, the art market and the NFT market? They're identical. Right? The only difference between the conventional art market and the NFT market is that the conventional art market relies on physical objects. You purchase an artwork, you receive a physical token that represents ownership of the artwork. In the NFT market, when you buy the token, right, what, you're, what it enables you to do is to trade in the ledger entry itself. That's all that's happening in the conventional art market anyway. You're buying and selling catalog raisin entries. The NFT marketplace, or rather, the NFT market simply gets rid of the physical token and allows you to trade in, in the ledger entry itself, right? And that's, I think, really interesting and important. Why is that? Well, on one level, which I won't get into in too much detail, but I've written about uh, in an essay a little while back, I think that the NFT marketplace shows how copyright might become obsolete. Right? So Amy Adler has pointed out uh, in the past that the art market as such doesn't need copyright. Why not? Because the value proposition is not in reproducing the painting. It's in the, well, she says it's in the object itself. I, th I would actually go a step further and say it's in the ability to invest in the artist's celebrity. It's the fact that when you buy an artwork, what you're investing in is, this, is the popularity of the artist. The NFT marketplace enables exactly the same thing, but generalizes it and makes it, uh, makes it possible to use that same market mechanism in relation to anything. Right? Because of course, an NFT doesn't have to represent digital image. Right now, that's the convention, but an NFT can represent anything you want it to. OK. So what is a security? Right? I ask this question because the SEC has recently been making a lot of noises about wanting to regulate the crypto markets and wanting to regulate NFT markets specifically. So in order to understand what the SEC is doing and why, I think we need to take a brief foray into securities law. And in order to do that, I want to take a step back and look once again at the work of mine that I showed you, uh, SEC no action letter request. So this was a work that I created is a work of conceptual art in the form of a legal scholarship styled as a prospectus for the sale of a work of conceptual art titled SEC No. So what I did was write to the SEC, write, or rather, I sent a no action letter request to the SEC proposing to sell a work of art titled SEC No Action Letter Request that consists of sending an SEC no action letter request to the SEC proposing to sell said work of conceptual art. And in the no action letter request letter and the accompanying prospectus, which was published in uh, the Law Review, I believe. Um, I uh, explained to 
the SEC why the conceptual artwork I was proposing to sell satisfied all of the four Howey test factors. And therefore, what I was proposing to do was sell an unregistered security. And therefore, the SEC should deny my no action letter request. Um, so a friend of mine actually just described it as the uh, first uh, SEC action letter request he had ever had. Kind of, come at me, bro, right? <laughs> Regulate me, please. Um, uh, Gensler was not interested. Uh, I did not hear back from the SEC in response to my no action letter request. And in fact, when I sent FOIA requests to the SEC, uh, they refused to produce any information in response to my FOIA request, citing the deliberative privilege. After several additional attempts, I did receive a, a selection of emails and documents from the SEC, all of which were entirely redacted, as if this was sort of high security uh, operation. Uh, there, there was only two lines from like SEC general counsel uh, in an email, uh, in sort of an email exchange. For some reason, they didn't redact. And in one of those sentences, referred to my proposal as fanciful, which I was found delightful. Um, <laughs> uh, and they, I, I actually sent an appeal of the uh, of the redaction, uh, arguing that that their their rules didn't extend as broadly as they thought they did. They denied the appeal. Um, I figure I'm going to kind of leave it at that. Well, why, why do I bring this up, right? Well, the Howey test is supposed to describe what is a security for the purpose of regulating under the securities laws. It's, it's supposed to describe the scope of the SEC's regulatory authority. The problem is, if you take the Howey test seriously, right, what is, an what is a security? The investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the others. If you take the Howey test seriously, just squint a little bit, it covers basically every, right? Almost any investment can be characterized as an investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits from the others. Why does that matter? Because there's a fifth shadow factor. It's actually the only, which is, does it look like a security? Is it the kind of thing that the SEC is used to regulating? Because that's what the SEC regulates. It regulates things that look like security. And that's it, right? That's all that really matters when it comes to the regulatory decision, right? So. It makes us realize, then, that when we ask the question, what is a security, we really need some scare quotes around the is, because it's not an ontological question. right? It's not like securities have some special feature that distinguishes them from other kinds of investment. Something is a security if the SEC decides it wants to regulate. That's what makes it a security. right? It's a security when the SEC wants wants to regulate, and it's not a security, at least in the relevant sense, if the SEC decides it doesn't to regulate. And this really struck me, right, when I was looking at the, con Oops, sorry. When I was looking at the conversation in the NFT sort of ecosystem about how to avoid SEC regulation, because they were very concerned, they still are very concerned about uh, about being regulated, that it, being regulated by the SEC will prevent them from being able to do the kinds of things that they want to do. And there's a lot of conversation about, oh, you know, what kind of magic words do we use? How do we characterize our project in order to make it not a security and therefore something the SEC can't regulate? And I just had to step in over and over again and say, guys, that's just not how it works, right? There's no magic words. If the SEC wants to regulate, it'll regulate irrespective of what you say you're doing or how you characterize. The question is what the SEC wants to do and why. And I think you need to take a different tack. Right? You need to ask yourself, what do we say to the SEC? How do we describe what we're doing and why we're doing it to the SEC that will inform its regulatory decisions in ways that will be beneficial to the market uh, and, and to invest in? Right? So the broader point is that you know, is the NFT market a securities market? Yes. But so is the art market. The art market has always been a securities market because when you invest in artwork, 
what are you doing? You're investing money in a common enterprise, namely the artist's career, with a reasonable expectation of profits, right? You're investing money because you want the value of your artwork to go up, to be derived from the efforts of others. The collectors aren't promoting the artist's career and making the artist famous, at least not exclusively, right? The artists are promoting their career and making themselves famous, right? So every time you invest in work, in, a, in an artwork, you're investing in a securities market. The thing is, it doesn't look like security, the SEC, because we have this fiction that when you invest in an artwork, you're buying as an object, right? But we're smarter than that, right? We know you're not really buying an object. The object is just the token that represents ownership of, of the catalog, right? What you're really investing in is artist career. You're, 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 in a, you're effectively buying a security interest in the future value of the artist's career. That's it. That's a security, right? But the SEC hasn't regulated it. Why not? Well, on one level, again, because it doesn't think it looks like a security. But I suspect another reason is the SEC doesn't think it has a whole lot of value to add to regulating. It doesn't understand the art market. The people participating in the art market don't want SEC regulation. And it doesn't fit the SEC model for what it actually does, which is primarily disclosure of information about a business enterprise. Right? What happens when you have to register a security? Well, you have to produce a whole lot of information about your, about your business enterprise and make it available to the public. Right? And for two different reasons, right? On one level, the SEC wants to engage in market regulation in order to protect the markets and make them more orderly. On another level, the SEC wants to protect consumers from uh, being defrauded by uh, unscrupulous that are uh, selling shares in companies that aren't, uh, that aren't as valuable as they purport to be. It uses the same mechanism to accomplish both of those goals, the production of information, the goals themselves, right? The regulatory mandates aren't always entirely each other, right? So, what's the big difference? What's the big change? Well, I, th I think the, the main thing is that the art market didn't look or doesn't look like a securities market to the SEC because of the objects associated with it. Because the longstanding fiction that's what what's being bought and sold is is really an object rather than a uh, rather than a securitized investment. The, S the NFT market, by eliminating the physical token entirely and enabling investors to trade the catalog entries, to trade the ledger entries directly, looks a lot more like a securities market, the SEC. And therefore, the SEC feels like it needs to regulate it, but doesn't know how. Right? It doesn't know what to do yet. It's very puzzled by this market because it doesn't understand why people are investing in NFTs in the first place. It sees this all as a great delusion, which it may very well be. Right? Is it possible this market could collapse? And people say it already has collapsed. Boy, people are still buying and selling. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I think it's, we're certainly seeing an, one of many dips in the, uh, in the uh, investment in the NFT marketplace. The question is what the SEC is going to do about it and why. And what I want the SEC to reflect on before it starts regulating the NFT marketplace is why it hasn't already been regulating the art market. Because I think the SEC needs to understand why it doesn't regulate the art market in order to understand why it should or shouldn't regulate the NFT market. And what's more, what it should want that regulation to accomplish, if anything. Because I think the, the NFT market is actually offers a lot of, pro, a, a lot of potential economic problems. Right? Why is that? Because it enables the securitization of, in effect, celebrity or the clout associated with celebrity. And there's a lot of untapped value out there. Right? The example I like to use is the Kardashians. Right? Could the Kardashians have existed without Web2, without social media? Right? I don't think so. Right? Their entire careers are premised on being able to, in effect, sell their celebrity through social media. In a pre-social media era, it would have been essentially impossible for them to monetize in the way that they did. I think the NFT marketplace at least hints at the possibility 
of doing the same thing, but on a much broader scale, right? And think about it, the social value of celebrity is huge. How many people are talking about the Kardashians right now, right? We think that, oh my God, they're making so much money, but think about how much social value they're generating and what a tiny fraction of that social value they're generating, they're actually personally able to recoup. Imagine if you could invest directly in the social value, in the clout of the Kardashians, rather than having to do so through purchasing a product line or getting them to advertise something for you. Right? They have all these revenue streams, but why can't they securitize their celebrity itself? I think the NFT marketplace at least theoretically makes that possible, and I think there could be a huge amount of social value directed to creators of every stripe. Right? So authors in a traditional sense, but also anyone who engages in authorship of the self can all of a sudden, at least potentially, monetize their value if people think they're going to be more famous in the future than they are today. And I think this says something about why the SEC may or may not, ultimately, if it, if it, if it sees it in what I think is the right way, see this as a productive forum for regulation. One thing I'd like the SEC to reflect on is whether or not it's actually the right agency. Okay? On one level, it sees this as a Secure, as, potentially as a securities market, because it kind of looks like a securities market. It kind of looks like people buying and selling stocks, but somehow in a very odd way. But if the SEC is concerned about consumer protection, I'd suggest there are other agencies better situated to pursue goals, right? Why the SEC rather than, rather than the Federal Trade Commission or the CF, the Consumer Financial Protection? All of those agencies, those kinds of agencies, know a lot more about consumer protection and know a lot more about consumer appetites and might actually be in a better position to regulate this new and emerging, uh, this new and emerging market and, and economy. So I'll leave it there um, and uh, open it up for, for questions from the audience. We're talking about the Kardashians. You said that they're, how many people are talking about them? And then you equated that to they're creating social value. So if I understand correctly, something to talk about, something to connect with between people, social value. I think the difference between securities, which is mainly something that is like a commodity, that is like wheat or corn, it's the same whether you have wheat over here or wheat over there. Um, artwork create social value and that it's something to talk about. Even if it's not being sold in the art uh, market, if it's on a wall, it's something to say, look, this famous person, this, this is something that I'm connected with. And so in that sense, how would you define social value? Because in my mind, that is what makes the art market not regulable, regulable by the uh, SEC. And so in my mind, that social uh, value, it, it, it just maybe that's kind of like the unspoken thing that happens. I, I want to see your view on that. Right. So, what is social value? How would I define social value? And why am I defining it in the way that I am? I'm very agnostic, right? I'm very open minded about it. social value is anything that produces positive externalities, right? So, anything that people want to consume has social value. People really, really, really want to consume celebrity a lot. We like it, we like to talk about it, we want more of it. We don't think about it as a consumption good, but it absolutely is, right? We just don't have to pay for it, right? We've treated it as a public good, historically, because there was no good way to restrict and, and limit it. But think about it, right? We take copyright and ownership of works of authorship for granted, but that's a historically contingent phenomenon, right? Prior to the invention of copyright by, by the Stationers Guild, right? Works of authorship were treated as public goods and anyone could reproduce them at will. There was no limitation on the production or consumption of those goods. Copyright came into existence merely as a way of solving transactions costs in the creation and distribution, primarily, originally, really the distribution of, of works of authorship. Copyright made investing in works of authorship financially feasible by enabling uh, publishers to create some possibility or some reasonable possibility of recouping their upfront financial. It was, it was a way of, of getting their, their, uh, their investment 
back out of the product that, that they were producing. I think what's happening here with the NFT market is that first what it's doing is enabling us to go back to a more efficient open access model for works of authorship by enabling authors to monetize the popularity of their work directly rather than limiting access to the works. Um, I also think it, it illustrates the extent to which the conventional securities market maybe isn't necessarily the market for what we think it is either, right? Because we tell ourselves, and the SEC in particular, tells itself a fiction about how the, how the financial markets, how the securities markets work and why people are investing in them, that they're investing in the fundamentals of the businesses in question. I'm not sure that's true, right? I think a lot of what people are investing in when they invest in the securities market is brands, right? People are investing in the securities market because they think a particular company has a strong brand and it's likely to be uh, even stronger and more popular in the future, right? We can tell ourselves a story where people are kind of rationally investing in the fundamentals of Apple or Tesla or Google or, or whatever, but the reality is that that's not how people actually make those investment decisions. They ask themselves, is this a brand that's gonna be cool, or is it gonna be cooler in the future than it is today? And really that's exactly what I'm describing, right? It's, it's, it, it, you're saying, is this something that informs the way we think about the world? Is this something that connects people together? Is this something that adds social value, right? But if we think about markets in that way, all of a sudden the role of the SEC, the regulatory role of the SEC, becomes a lot harder to understand. Like what role, what is it actually trying to accomplish? And are its interventions well tailored to the goals it says it wants to achieve? Maybe at some, at some point, right, the regulatory invention, interventions can themselves become, can, can the, themselves become in, inefficient, become a transaction cost rather than a solving transactions cost. And that's, I think, where we start, have to start being careful that we're not just doing things because we always, we always did them before. So I mean, a lot of say is like, look, I'm not at all opposed to regulation of the NFT market. In fact, I think in a lot of respects, it'd be a good thing, right? It could use a little bit of external, like, you know, information, uh, sort, of, sort of guidelines about how to operate in a transparent and, and open way. Although the level of transparency on the blockchain is already incredibly high, right? So if we think about the SEC's typical role as one of requiring disclosure. Well, on the, on the blockchain, all those transactions are automatically available for everyone in the world to see publicly. Right? So a lot of the disclosure is happening automatically without there having to be any a regulatory mandated disclosure. There might be additional disclosures we think would be valuable. Right? There might be ways of providing information to consumers so they better understand what's taking place. I think the problem is that the regulatory agencies don't understand what's taking place yet. And they don't want to. Right? They don't like this development because it's very unfamiliar and disconcerting to them. And they, they, they don't want to see what's actually happening. And so I'm a little disappointed in the regulators because I think that they need to do a little introspection. And uh, I think they're a, a touch hubristic about their ability to understand and regulate the markets in question. And I think they need to take some time to learn what's actually taking place before they willy nilly start regulating things. Jasmine. Hi. Thank you for this very interesting talk, as always. Um, I, I, I think that there's a couple of assumptions embedded in your conversation about artwork. And I want to unpack some of those assumptions, but I have a totally different question that I want to focus on. So part of the assumptions, we're talking about PGSs, right? A uh, pictorial graphical sculpture. We're not talking about other types of artwork. It's not sound recordings. It's not musical compositions. It's not audiovisual or architectural works. So it's a limited form. And then even within that, it's more limited to the fine art collectibles market. Um, and I think it's important to draw that distinction because part of what we are starting to see with NFTs is moving beyond that fine art market. And so is it functioning the same? Is it a democratization of kind of what we see in the fine art market is I think some of what you're saying, but it requires unpacking maybe some of those assumptions a little bit and thinking about whether there's sufficient analogies there. Sure, yeah, um, so, what, so what is the NFT market then? And how does it relate to the conventional art market? I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, right? I think the, the, the sort of the limitation uh, on the conventional art market and also the reason, again, that it 
that it was hard for people to see its underlying nature as a effectively a securities market was that it was so limited to a, a particular category of works and that it was so heavily circumscribed by the people who effectively were controlling the art market by controlling what, what counted as an artwork and what they were willing to invest in as an artwork. So the art market, uh, you know, one of its big liabilities, be benefits and liabilities, depending on whether you're an insider or an outsider, is the lack of transparency and the exclusivity of the art market it meant that only insiders were ever really able to invest productively in, in the art market. And outsiders, uh, well, there's, there's another word that I've used for outsiders in the art market, a technical term, it's suckers. <laughs> right, if you're investing in the art market and you're not an insider, you're guaranteed to lose your money, right? There's no way you're going to make a return on your investment because it's just not how it works, right? I think the interesting thing about the NFT market is that it gets rid of a lot of the exclusivity and insider, not entirely, right? But it's a lot more transparent than the conventional art market is. I mean, it's transparent at all, right? But it's actually, it's actually extremely transparent in relation to the transactions and who owns things and so on and so forth. I think what's also interesting about it is that it, it explodes entirely the categories of works of authorship or even things that can be the subject of a market transaction, right? So we no longer have to have the fiction that in order to be a participant in the art market economy, you have to be producing a particular kind of physical tokens, right? All of a sudden, you don't have to be producing a particular kind of anything at all, right? I think the reason the NFT marketplace developed in the way that it did in relation to digital images is that the digital images were close enough to our concept of what an art market looks like, that people participating in the NFT marketplace could wrap their heads around the idea that nominal ownership of, uh, of a digital image could be valuable insofar as people were competing for the, I, I like, again, I like to call it ownership, like I have more power than you do because I have the clout associated with being the person who owns this desirable NFT that represents ownership of a particular a limited group of, of images, it's, it's a status symbol, right? It's kind of a, it's a, it's a vabling good, it's a, it's a luxury good. Uh, it, it, it represents being cool, at least within the relevant uh, social groups, and therefore uh, it's valuable uh, as a status good. But I wonder if by thinking about the democratization of NFTs and kind of the, if that changes maybe our concept and challenges a little bit your concept of what the art marketplace really is. Because to me, thinking of the art marketplace as an investment, it makes sense for only those insiders. And the outsiders, maybe they're not suckers, maybe they're just not investing. They're rather thinking about, I want to look like I have an expensive piece of artwork. It doesn't matter whether it increases in value. What matters is the appearance that I can afford expensive piece of artwork. Or, hey, I just like this art, right? So instead of thinking of them as suckers, they're just not playing the investment game the same way. And so I think that maybe presents a little bit of a challenge to this notion that the only value we have in the art marketplace is the ownership. Um, and the ability to have that prominence. But it also opens a second question, which is that, therefore, is there a countervailing obligation, therefore, by the artist, by art galleries, by owners, to, to either work to increase your investment value or commit to engaging in a reasonable catalog raisonné? Because if I recall correctly, the Andy Warhol Foundation will no longer authenticate and will not update, update their catalog raisonné. There are other experts that refuse they're, they are the sole experts for a particular artist, but they refuse to do authenticity checks anymore because of the way litigation has, has handled um, their expertise. And there are catalog resumes that cannot be updated as a result. If the only value that I'm buying is the catalog resume, doesn't that mean there's an obligation that we are then implying on the art world and the artist to make clear when things are authentic and to keep an updated catalog resume, one that doesn't exist right now, and maybe that's where the SEC could come in. Sure, yeah, so I'll, 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 there are a lot of questions. A lot of pieces <laughs> of my battery I mean, of my computer is running out, so I had to throw it all out of my Yeah, computer. yeah, so I mean, I would, I would start, I'll start by just talking a little bit about catalog resumes and how they work within the art market. You're right that this has been contentious for a long time. Again, it's been contentious significantly because outsiders to the art market have purchased what they believed or hoped 
was a valuable artwork on the art market, uh, only to learn later that it was not considered authentic for one reason or another, and therefore it was unsaleable on, on the art market. And, and actually, there's a, there's a great BBC show where they investigate the provenance of different works of, of art and, um, and determine in the course of the show whether or not it is uh, authentic or not. But the really in, what's really interesting about that, about the show and about the process for me, is how it works in practice. And it doesn't seem to occur to them, the people on the show, that this, or any of the people participating, that this is weird at all. But what do they do? Right? They engage in a, a whole um, enterprise of evidence gathering, both gathering historical evidence, as well as physical evidence about the object in question in order to make a case for the, for the object in question being a work actually created by a particular artist. But then once they've established this dossier of information, they then go to an authenticator, right, who decides whether or not it is a work by the artist in question. And it's a, it, it's a purely subjective judgment on the part of the authenticator, right? But the way they frame it in the show is, well, now's the moment of truth. We're gonna find out whether or not it's real, in which real only means a work that has value on the art market, right? It has nothing to do with the factual question of the background of the work. The reality of the work, the authenticity of the work is determined entirely on whether or not the marketplace will recognize it as an authentic work, which is to say, I think that underscores my observation that what you're really doing is you're in effect buying a share in the artist's celebrity. You're buying a share in the artist's career and the authentication process is merely determining whether or not you bought a legitimate share or, or not. And now you're right, uh, of course, that a lot of artists' estates have gotten out of the uh, explicit authentication business, but I think it would be a, a foolish to think that that doesn't mean authentication isn't happening, it's just happening sub rosa, right? So what's really happening is the art market sort of uh, has an unspoken sort of perspective as to whether or not particular works are real and authentic or not, and they don't need the pronouncements of an, of an official authenticator to do so, right? Because the, the market is, because the, 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 the number of investors is small enough and information is of high enough a premium that it can happen without that. And, and, and I think you're right. I mean, if the SEC were to look at that and, and see its fundamental nature as an, a de facto securities market, there's plenty of room for disclosure on the art market, right? There's a lot the SEC could do to increase the transparency of the art market. I think that would destroy the art market because I don't think that the people investing in artwork would continue to want to invest. And, and, and when I say art market, I don't mean the market for objects, right? I don't mean the market for things that look nice, because that's irrelevant, right? It doesn't matter what the, art, what the artwork looks like for the purpose of the art market. All that matters is whether or not you can sell it for a higher price than you bought it for. All that matters is whether the celebrity, whether the career, whether the commercial goodwill of the artist in question went up or down. Right? That's what you're investing in, not the object itself. So this makes me feel better about the fact that there's a lot of really, really expensive art I don't like. Because clearly <laughs> it's not about whether or not the art is likable or not. But, but it, it does still make me wonder about whether that's the right definition of the art market or if that's just a subcategory that we're talking about. That's a very small category. The question is whether that small subcategory right. is eligible. And that NFTs being as different and broad as they are don't necessarily fit into the same concerns and should be treated as analogous to that very small investment-based buyer as opposed to the bulk of art that's sold, whether it's at like a local art fair or you know one of the galleries downtown or something like that that isn't necessarily investing in the fact that this art will appreciate over time. So again, which market? I, I, I think the thing that for me that makes the NFT marketplace really interesting is that it takes the, is what you rightly describe as a kind of tiny sliver of the what we think of as the broader art market, right? The, the art market in investment products as opposed to the art market in consumption goods, right? And I think it extends the potential for it being an investment market 
like far, far, far more broadly by bringing in a lot more potential investors, right? By making the, 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 the transactions costs associated with investment much smaller, by radically increasing the liquidity of products on the market, and by enabling anyone to participate without needing to be kind of authenticated, as it were, by the people who actually ultimately control what counts as an investment product on, on the art market. Right? So in a sense, I mean, I guess if you wanted to, you could say that maybe one reason the SEC hasn't looked to regulating the conventional art market is that everyone who's participating is already, by definition, an accredited investor, and therefore the SEC doesn't see a need to regulate them as, uh, to regulate them as uh, unregistered securities. Uh, whereas in the NFT marketplace, there's an awful lot of people who are not accredited investors in the kind of securities regulation sense, and therefore the, the need for some form of consumer-oriented regulation is, is higher. I, I'm sympathetic to that idea. I think that if we look at it that way, then it becomes a question of what does the SEC think it can do to add value and actually protect people from the risks associated with the market? Because I think the market, like I said, I think the market has a lot of promise insofar as there's a lot of untapped social value out there that that the, the kind of the creators of that social value have been unable to monetize, right? Artists have not had a way, so <laughs> humorously, celebrities have not really had good ways of fully realizing the social value that they generate, and they're always looking for new avenues to do so, right? Things like Cameo, for example. That's just celebrities like trying to maximize the value of the social value that are the, the economic value of the social value that they're trying to, trying to internalize some of those positive externalities that, that they're generating. But I think there's a lot more out there. And then if we can find a way to enable people to sort of bring speculators in, as it were, we could actually release a lot of social value and, and, and also redistribute it in certain kinds of interesting we are unfortunately out of time, so let's thank our speaker one more time.